What's the difference? What are the what are the differences that that you're seeing both from their perspective and from yours? Well, the content that I teach is pretty much the same. The sales is sales. People are people. Influence is influence. And if you're really good at sales and influence, it doesn't really matter. Alan has started and grown several multi-million dollar businesses. His mission is to help you do the same. Welcome to the Business Growth Pod, building the future one entrepreneur at a time. Hey everyone, welcome to the Business Growth Pod. I'm your host, Alan Draper. So thankful that you're spending time with me today. Make sure that you're following me on Instagram. I'm at Real Alan Draper. I'm always sharing tips and tricks on there about starting businesses, real estate, building wealth, and just general life advice, things that have worked for me. So make sure to follow me at Real Alan Draper. Today, I'd like to welcome to the show, Justin Janowski. Justin is an entrepreneur with two decades of sales, leadership, and business development experience. He's the founder and CEO of Faith to Influence and host of the company's podcast, Sales Strategies for Christian Coaches. He's also a devoted husband and father of two children. Welcome to the show, Justin. Glad to have you. Thanks for having me, Alan. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, that's, I mean, it sounds like you're a busy man. I like talking to fathers because I feel like I have a lot to learn. Mm. I have three small children of my own, 11 and nine-year-old boys and a five-year-old yeah. daughter. And I think the pressures of being a, a father entrepreneur, especially like a faith-based father entrepreneur, I think they're unique mm -hmm. because we can get pulled in a bunch of different directions. Let's talk about that for a little bit. What are some things that have worked for you as somebody that clearly has this faith-inspired life that, you know, family is super important, but at the same time you're building a business and you want to make sure you're taking care of professional obligations, financial obligations that you have for your family. How do you keep those things in check? That's a good question. And, you know, I probably need to learn from you about parenting a little bit. My kids are three and five, so they're really young. You're a, you're a stage ahead of us, curious about the grade school years, actually excited for the grade school years. I'll say with a three and five-year-old at home, there are times where I'm wondering, how do people have a business, have a marriage that they pour into, be a dad, and like take care of their lawn? I'm like, H do people mow their own lawns? Do they pull their own weeds? How are they doing that? I see people doing that in my neighborhood, and I wonder, how is it possible that they can do all of that? For me, I, I really want to have boundaries around my business. I want to you know, be clear about the hours I'm going to work. I'm not an ultimate hustler as an entrepreneur. Uh, I built a multiple six-figure business but I do it in a way that feels really easy and light for me as much as I can so that I can pour into my family and my faith, my other priorities. There's a part of me that wants to be a really successful entrepreneur. And there's another part of me that just wants to throw the next great barbecue in my neighborhood and, uh, you know, <laughs> crack open a beer and watch the Packers and have a good time. And so like I balance those two things by really only working between 930 and five Monday through Friday, unless I'm at a live event or leading a live event. I balance it by trying to take time off during the week. So I'll take a half day or a day off during the day during the week uh, because I know as a parent of three and five-year-olds and with a wife who needs me and depends on me and, and with that yard I referenced that I have a hard time keeping up with, there's too much for me to do evenings and weekends. Sometimes it doesn't feel like a break. Sometimes the weekend can feel more challenging because of how much responsibility I have to my family than the work day, which at times can feel natural and easy for me. And so if I really need time off, it's got to be during the week, during the day when my wife is at work and my kids are at school so I can recharge enough to be who I need to be for them on the weekends. It's funny because I say, you know, after and I have a family vacation coming up next week, but I say, you know, two thirds of the way through the family vacation, I, you know, I'll, I'll say something to myself about how I need a vacation and need to relax by, and by going back to work. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's a, it's a lot easier for us to do that. I recently I've been on this this journey that I think is going to continue the rest of my life and that is understanding the relationship that I have with time. Mm -hmm. I have 29 businesses, I have two podcasts, I have small children, I'm very active in my church and my community. I go to the gym every day and I really like what you were saying about how you know, on one hand, you want to be, you know, you have this passion, be this incredible entrepreneur. 
and on the other you just wanted to throw the best you know barbecue in the neighborhood and watch the Packers game yeah and I think even though kind of that was a whimsical comment I I think they're I think that's deep man I think that's deep because I'm trying to decrease my golf handicap right now and I play pickup basketball and it's like you you got to pick Mm-hmm. You got to pick. I'm reading this book right now, Justin, and it's called Deep Work. And it's, you, you know, the author, it's incredible. I highly recommend it. I'm halfway through. The author talks about how our lives, our happiness, and the full sense of fulfillment that we have is directly related to the depth that we go with our endeavors. And he talks about the issues that social media and the kind of this distracted world that we live in, how that's decreasing overall happiness. But I think step one, we identify, yes, I do want to improve my outside shooting, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do want to decrease my, my handicap, but what do I want most, right? Put those big rocks in the jar first and then you can figure out how to sort everything else out talk to me about what you're doing with faith to influence what is that and what's the purpose behind it what are you trying to accomplish yeah i started faith to influence in 2019 and initially alan it was a men's christian entrepreneurial group and Mm -hmm. it was trying to trying to be kind of all encompassing in coaching and personal development we were working with men on their family life, being better husbands and fathers. We were working with them on their businesses, being better leaders and salespeople. And we were working with them on their faith and kind of integrating the three pieces. Ultimately, like that, that picked up faster than I expected. In my first year, we collected over 250K in revenue. I was just hoping to make 60 or 70 grand and show that this was going to be something that long-term could work. And so that was uh, an exciting first year. And some of those entrepreneurial men were coaches. And what I recognize is that Many of those coaches struggled with sales. They struggled with money mindset. They struggled mm-hmm. with the business side of things. They struggled charging something for a service that they were providing. And they felt like they were selling themselves and it was different than a tangible product. And that stuff was easy for me. Sales, pricing, business design, that's always been easy, natural, and fun for me. And I don't, I know it's not for most. And so as I worked with some of those coaches, I realized that that was my sweet spot. I loved working with them. It was really fun helping them launch their businesses, grow their businesses, create something that they were really proud of that had consistent revenue and could have financial viability to take care of them and their families. And so I've gone all in on that over the last couple of years. And there's really two parts to my business. One, I work with a newer Christian coach primarily, some non-Christians as well. The content's just as good, whether you're faith-based or not, but that's my niche. So I can pray with people and bring God into the space. And I work with those coaches to help them with that initial design and the pricing and sales strategy and overcoming some old fears and stories about sales and money so that they can grow a successful business. And then the other side of it is I get hired by six to eight figure companies to do sales directly for them. People like Pedro Deo and Pete Vargas and John Acuff, Dr. Darius Daniels. I mean, I I could go on. There's a lot of of people that we've worked with in this and they're already really established. They just need sales support. And some of them are non-Christians. David Bayer running a $5 million business, not not Christian at all, but hires us to come in and do the sales for him because they want high integrity sales. And so that part's fun for us as well. We could probably make more money doing just that, but I love working with the new entrepreneur. It's fun. So when you're, you know, coaching somebody that's faith-based versus not faith-based. And I, I honestly don't have an agenda with this question. Yeah. What's the difference? What are the, what are the differences that, that you're seeing both from their perspective and from yours? Well, the content that I teach is pretty much the same. Sales is sales. People are people. Influence is influence. And if you're really good at sales and influence, it doesn't really matter whether it's Christian or not, or whether someone is a Christian or not employing the strategy. What I think maybe sets the way I do sales apart from some others is that the way I do sales has really high integrity. It feels really good. I think a lot of people are afraid, even entrepreneurs who want to start a business, they've got this service they want to provide and then they get into their business and they're like, oh no, I have to make sales before I can provide the service. How am I going to do that? And many of us have old stories about sales being slimy or greedy or Mm -hmm. deceptive or pushy and things like that in one way or another off-putting or bad and and i think that 
the way that I teach sales is through a Christian lens of like, what is good in the way I see it? What would honor God? What's honest and true and fair for both sides? I believe in win, win or no deal in business. And all of these tactics and strategies that I bring through a Christian lens make sense for somebody who's non-Christian who just wants to be a high integrity salesperson, build a high integrity business. They're very influential strategies. We still want to be successful. We want to make it easy for the right people to say yes, but we want to do it in an honorable way. So the difference between working with a Christian and non-Christian is probably just that with the Christian, I can say, hey, let's let's bring this to God. Let's pray about this. And I, I'm going to pray like, hey, God, I, I want to pray that you bless Alan's business. I want to pray, pray that as you bring more clients, more revenue, more success to him, that he becomes more and more of a blessing to his neighbors, to his church, to his community, and to the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm not going to give that prayer if I'm with a non-Christian. Although, if we're eating dinner, I'll probably ask if they're okay with me praying, and I might pray just like I did right now. So that's that's primarily the, the difference between it. But I think that when I work with Christian coaches in a group setting, many of them have shared challenges, shared stories about money, like money's the root of all evil. Bible doesn't say that, but that's that's a misconception among other things. And so those shared problems are ones that I can handle in a group setting that many of them are facing. That's cool. You know, I grew up in a small farming community, very conservative, right on the border of Oregon and Idaho. I went to religious university, private university, that Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah, that sometimes referred to, we, we refer it to as the, the bubble. Mm -hmm. And I did, I went to law school at Arizona State. And I remember my my first term, I became really good friends with my buddy Lon. And Lon, uh, went, he went to Princeton, East Coast guy, more of a West Coast guy. And Lon, after a while, I got to know that he didn't necessarily believe in God. And I'm like, okay, that's really weird. And I, Lon was like the kindest the most honest, had the most integrity of pretty much anyone I'd ever met in my life. And in terms of like the, the some of those big rocks, religion, faith, some politics, like some political issues, we couldn't be more different. Mm -hmm. And it was my first time like realizing like how he was just a really good, you know, person. Mm -hmm. And so you telling me this, like how there's people out there, faith based or not, they just want to, they, they want to be honest in their sales, which, you know, I own a bunch of companies and one of my businesses is we have teams of door to door salesmen mm -hmm. and, you know, lines get blurred quite a bit there. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really cool that you can kind of have this perspective of, yes, th my faith is super important to me. But there are people that are outside that that still value a lot of the same principles. But I mean, case in point, you mentioned win, win or no deal, which is one of the habits of one of the seven habits of highly effective people that, you know, Stephen Covey included in his monumental book. And I think, you know, to me, what it comes down to is I think that there are laws that govern this world. I think that there are spiritual laws. I think there are physical laws, gravity. I think there are financial laws, professional laws. And regardless of, kind of the specifics people want to you know follow those laws because that's how you obtain prosperity in those different areas yeah, yeah um, no question about it the talk to me a little bit about when somebody says hey we want to be really clear and transparent through through our sales process what does that include for you what are you making sure what are the highlights of that yeah well i think for many people it's just them learning that they can be in sales and, and they can be a good salesperson and that can be a good thing, that it can be honorable for them to be in sales. I feel like most of the marketplace, people in sales and people in entrepreneurship who are struggling are struggling because of sales avoidance. They're avoiding having the real sales conversation. They're avoiding prospecting. They're avoiding knocking on the next door to your door to door salespeople because there's a fear of what that's going to be experience is going to be like and what that's going to mean about who they are. And there's a fear of rejection. There's a fear of bothering people. There's a fear of being yeah. seen as a salesperson or being salesy. Yeah. And we think that this is a bad thing. And because so many of us have these old stories about sales being a bad or negative thing, we avoid it. 
we don't take action on it. And if we think that like to be a successful salesperson, we'd have to be a dishonest person, but we value ourselves as an honest person and we happen to find ourselves in sales, then we're just not going to take very much action because we're not going to want to take on that identity. And so for many people, especially I'm working with a new entrepreneur, maybe they haven't been in sales. They haven't been an entrepreneur in the past. They've got this idea. They want to bring it forward and they just can't imagine getting on a sales call. I don't have to teach them how to be honest. I just need to teach them that being honest and being a salesperson who's successful can can be done. I have to help them rewrite some of those old stories. You know, I believe sales when done right is simply making it as easy as possible for the right people to say yes. And it's transparent. And in transparency, to continue answering your question though, the tactically, like I'm gonna look at things like how do we market? You know, I, I think that like almost everybody in the, the marketplace who's a coach sells their programs for 997 or 19997 if it's a $20,000 program. And to me, when I hear 19,997 said out loud, it's just a little trigger for me because it's $20,000. Taking $3 off a $20,000 program to me feels like slightly dishonest. Now, I have plenty of coaches and friends who do this. No offense to them. That's probably not where they're coming from at all. It's an old tactic. It's a marketing mm -hmm. tactic to keep people under a threshold. But for me, I evaluate all these tactics and say, what's right for me? What feels honest and true for me? And if somebody wouldn't buy my product at 10,000, but they would buy it at $9,997, <laughs> I don't want them to buy. You know, that's the client who's not going to make all their payments. That's the client who's going to be a problem later on. I don't want them to have that kind of experience. And so I want to be honest with my prices. So I'm going to say 10K if I'm selling a 10K program instead of 9997 or 20K instead of 19,997, those kinds of things. I'm not going to say this is only available for the next 24 hours. If I know that when somebody calls me next week and says, I'm ready to buy the $10,000 program, I've got my credit card, I would absolutely take that sale. And almost every coach in the marketplace who says, this closes at midnight, you will never get this price again, or this offer is only good for this call. Almost every single one of them who says that, if you came next week with your credit card and said, I'm ready for the 20K or whatever the program was, they would accept the payment, for which sure. means that they're lying to you about the false urgency. I can create real urgency by saying, if it makes sense for us to work together, it would feel really good for us to move forward in momentum and make the decision right now. Are you open to making a decision with momentum? so that we can get started. Like that is mm -hmm. real urgency. There's no lie to that. It's still direct. I'm still calling them forward into action, but it's just easier. Or I've, I've got a, a client or a prospect who I've had two sales calls with now. And normally people make a decision on one or two calls and she needed a third call. To talk to her husband mm -hmm. one more time. Like she wanted to work through something and that's unusual, but I, I want to end every single call with yes, no, or the next call booked. And we booked our next call for Friday. And before we wrapped, I said, just to make sure we're on the same page, are you committed to making a decision on Friday? She said, yes, absolutely. I don't mm -hmm. need to have some kind of false promise. I just need to ask her, is she committed to making a decision on Friday? Like those kind of assertive ways of showing up as a salesperson and leading are honest, they're influential, and they just don't use all that extra kind of fluffy stuff that's not really true. You know, I think it's interesting you talked about people starting their businesses and not wanting to go through the sales process or worry about revenue and things like that. And I've encountered that quite a bit. I remember talking to one gentleman, he was starting a home service company and man, he knew every detail for the next six months of his company, except how he was going to get revenue. And mm -hmm. we talked for about 15 minutes. And then I said, so how are you going to get money in the door, customers through the door? And he's like, you know, I haven't thought about that. I think one thing Justin is people, especially if they're following a passion, they're doing something that they would almost do anyway. They're, they feel a little guilty about mm -hmm. asking people to pay for it. Yeah. How do you help people overcome that? You know, specifically with what you said earlier about, you know, this idea that money is the root of all evil, not actually being in scripture. Right. Right. Yeah. What it says is the love of money is if we, if we make it an idol, we make it the most important thing. We make exactly. money more important than our neighbor. You know, like we, it, the Wolf of Wall Street kind of stuff. We've got commission breath. Like we want to make the sale no matter what at the expense of the other person. That's evil. That's bad. But when we hold money in its place, it's a tool. My story around money is the more I earn, the more I can give. And I know like 
great. If I charge a high and fair price for my services and I earn more money, I'm going to give. My wife and I have always tithed between 10 and 20%. We put a certain amount towards our church. We put a certain amount in a giving account. So when people are in need, we can help them. You know, I had a client last year who, a former client, she's going through a hard time, single mom. I had a catch up call with her and she just told me what was going on and her bills were tight. And we just sent her $4,500 and just said like, we got, we got this for you. And like, that was from our giving account. So it was an easy decision because it's already set aside. Like there's a structure kind of earmark that. for that. But yeah, like the more I earn, the more I can do that. The you know what? I that's earn, funny because I've shirt. heard it said that like people that think that money's evil haven't given enough of it away or something like that. That is a great great sentiment. It's so true. Like if we decide that, like if you're a high integrity, good person, who's going to do good with the things that you're given, then great. Let's take on that responsibility. Let's earn more. Let's have more of the good, high integrity, honest people earning more money so that they can give it and help people with it. But then the other piece of this is if there's like this guilt around it, it's also recognizing that we charge fair prices for our services, not only for ourselves and providing for our own families and the way we want to give, but also for the other person. You know, mm. if you were a, a health coach and I hired you to help me with my health, you look pretty fit. I'm working on that part of my life. <laughs> you're at the gym every day. Like if I was like, all right, cool, Alan, you're going to be my health coach. And you're like, okay, I'm going to coach you for free. Really easy for me to skip a call. Oh, yeah. Really easy for me not to show up yeah. if it's free. If, especially if you were like, yeah, like, let's do this. I'm like, all right, sure. It's easy for me to say yes, but not mean it. If you instead said, okay, you're gonna have to pay me a hundred dollars a month. Okay. Maybe I'd think twice about showing up, but honestly, a hundred dollars isn't that much to me right now. So I probably still would prioritize other things and skip our call. If it was a thousand dollars a month, I'm much more likely to show up because that would mean something to me. If you were charging me $10,000 a month and said that I was like, this was important enough to me. I was going to pay $10,000 a month. I would never miss a call. I would implement every single thing you told me because people like to get their money's worth. And so if we charge more for the service, we help the person that we're working with create the leverage they need to take action. We help them commit by taking real action. And I think like in a coaching or service-based business, our price point should stretch our prospects. It shouldn't, and our clients, it should not stress them. They shouldn't be deciding between paying our, our program or paying a bill or like right. feeding our family or getting the coaching. But people yeah. aren't really making that decision. It should stretch them though. It should feel challenging. If I hire somebody, somebody hires me to help them with sales, they don't like sales, they're scared of it. They've been avoiding sales for months or years. The more they pay me, the more likely they're actually going to overcome that fear and begin to take real action because the leverage is there. They owe it to their family and their bank account and everything else to act upon the investment that they've made. I love that. I've, I heard that concept recently where, you know, somebody, they, they had a course and one of something that was really important to them was the completion rate of mm -hmm. their course. And they decided that they were going to increase the cost of the course for some other reason, but they noticed that as soon as they did, the completion rate like doubled. And I think that's, you know, a fantastic lesson. I think we need as entrepreneurs, we need to get rid of this limiting belief that money's evil, that we're not worthy of being wealthy, that, you know, we're, we've heard people say that there's a certain amount of money that people just shouldn't have and things like that. And it's like money is this, it's a tool. It's like a shovel, right? Mm -hmm. You could do some really good things with it. You could do some bad things with a shovel. You could hit somebody with a shovel or, you know, steal something from your neighbor's yard or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, but the idea is there. And that is that it depends on how we use it. It's just like anything else. And I think that's so important when we're starting businesses and we need to, as entrepreneurs, there's so much we have to clear away. I, I'm i still mm -hmm. doing it. I imagine that at each level, I'm going to have new limiting beliefs that I need to get rid of that I hadn't even discovered before. But you have a higher purpose as an entrepreneur you, yeah. you and you need to look at it that way. You have this purpose, whether it's employing people, whether it's you know creating something that hasn't existed before you have this purpose and you need to fulfill it. And you cannot do that without revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's awesome. Tell me, give me a piece of entrepreneurial advice that you've received or you've come across, or you find yourself giving to others quite a bit 
that you think is just a must have? It's interesting. What's popping into my head in this moment is advice I received from Dave Durand when I was probably 18 years old. I was selling Cutco kitchen knives Mm -hmm. and I was at a conference, like my first personal development conference for this direct sales company. And Dave gave a great speech, but the simplest thing he said is the thing I've never forgotten. He said, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Yeah. Simple as obvious as that is, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. Like that, I've remembered that. And here's the advice for entrepreneurs that they need to hear. The main thing is making more sales. I mean, like uh, what we really want to do, oh, let's provide the service. Let's market. Mm -hmm. Let's, Let's do a podcast. I run a podcast. So do you. It can be a great strategy, a part of a strategy. Let's write a book. Let's have a social media marketing plan. But if we're doing a lot of things and we're not holding sales calls, we're forgetting to make the main thing the main thing, which is growing our business and actually helping people. And we can't help our clients until they've hired us to help them, not in the way that we'd like to, not in the deep, meaningful way that we'd really like to. They have to hire us first. And so everything begins with a sale. If we want to remain in momentum in our business, we need to make another sale and make another sale and make another sale. We need to take care of ourselves first and be successful first so we can continue to help others. And I think so many of us get distracted from the main thing. I know coaches and entrepreneurs who are revising their website for the fourth or fifth time and they've got zero clients and they're asking me the question of should I put my prices on my website or not but they've got zero clients no one is going to your website no one's going to go there and click and buy it doesn't matter whether you have your prices on the website or not it doesn't even matter whether or not you have a website right now what you need to do is text somebody or send somebody a message or an email and get on a call and have a real conversation and invite people to something that can help them you know that's what we need to do I like that advice. It reminds me of another of the seven habits and that's put first things first or Mm -hmm. keep first things first. And I think one of the issues, Justin, that people have when starting a business, especially if they are coming from that industry, they were a technician, quote unquote, in that industry. And they're like, geez, I'm really good at this. I'm really good at this aspect of it. Michael Gerber talks about in his book, The E-Myth, he uses the example of the local baker and she was, yeah. man, she made the best muffins. Right. And so she's like, man, I'm really good at making muffins. I don't get paid that much. Maybe I'm going to hang a shingle, my own bakery. She does that. And she's like, yeah, I'm really good at making bu- muffins. All she wants to do is make muffins. She realizes, Hey, there's a lot more to this business than just making muffins. Finds out she's spending most of her time not making muffins. So when you have that technician and that technician doesn't come from a sales background, How do you help them? How do you encourage them and kind of motivate them? Because man, sales, like, I I guess it's important, but that's not what I'm good at. Right. But the reality is like coming back to kind of the motivation, like, what do we really want? What are our goals? What are we trying to accomplish? And then we want to make sure that we design something that is going to be fun for that person to lead Mm. a business that's going to be fun and light and easy relative to what they'd like to accomplish. And so an example of this would be like, let's say that the the technician wants to earn $100,000, simple goal, but they're starting from scratch and they could design a program that costs $100 and they'd need to make a thousand sales, which means they'd have to spend all their time doing something they don't want to do. A thousand sales is hard to make. If instead they had a thousand dollar product, they'd only have to make a hundred sales. That's still a lot of sales for most people to make. That's a lot of time in sales process. If they instead had a ten thousand dollar product, they only need to make ten sales. Can we just help them make one sale a month? That's a significantly less challenging problem to solve, and it's going to take a lot less time to solve. It's going to be a lot more efficient. If instead they had a twenty thousand dollar product, they only need to make five sales. And so, oftentimes, like if we don't want to do more sales. Let's figure out the very best way we could help somebody and the most that we can charge for that. And let's work with those handful of clients to take care of the financial need of the business. And then from there, we can develop later on lower price, lower ticket programs. Once we have financial viability, we can hire a salesperson to do it for us. We can bring in, build out team with great jobs and and have other people working in the areas that we're not best at. So we can get back to, you know, making the great muffins. But initially... If you're a solopreneur, you're going to have to make some sales. A higher price tag means fewer sales, which means easier problem to solve. I like that approach. 
This has been awesome, Justin. Where do people go if they want to learn more about you? They want to learn more about Faith to Influence and kind of follow along. Yeah. A first idea would be to receive our free coaches playbook. It's, it's our 10-step sales process, the art of influence and mindset around sales. They can get that at goodsalespdf.com. They could also check out our podcast, which is Sales Strategies for Christian Coaches. Love it. Thanks for joining me today, Justin. Wish you nothing but the best, my man. Thank you, Alan. If you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave us a rating. And for daily inspiration and business tips, follow Alan on Instagram. Until next time, remember, we build the future one entrepreneur at a time.